get started, we'd like to share a quick message from Dell. With one phone call, Dell's dedicated U.S.-based advisors can customize tech solutions, including PCs powered by Intel, tailored to your business. Call 877-BY-DELL to connect with a Dell advisor today. From WHYY in Philadelphia, I'm Terry Gross with Fresh Air. Today, life after ballet for one of America's most acclaimed dancers. Wendy Whalen retired from the New York City Ballet at the age of 47 after a hip injury. She wasn't sure she'd ever dance again, but after reconstructive surgery and months of physical therapy, she briefly returned to the dance company that had been her home for 30 years. The new documentary, Restless Creature, focuses on that period when her identity was shattered. Now she does contemporary dance and finds her new life liberating. I've been strapped in, you know, physically. Strapped in to point shoes, strapped into a leotard and tights. My hair has been strapped up for my whole entire life. I don't like to be constricted now, but that was safe then. Also, Maureen Corrigan reviews a new novel set in 18th century New York. That's coming up on Fresh Air. Hey there, Paula Poundstone here. I hate to interrupt, but maybe you might like to listen to my new show, live from the Poundstone Institute, where I talk to researchers about interesting studies. It's like hidden brain, except our brains are really well hidden. Find it now on the NPR One app and wherever you listen to podcasts. Most dancers and athletes face a similar predicament. Their careers are virtually over in their late 30s or 40s. And then what? At the age of 47, my guest Wendy Whalen, who was described in the New York Times as America's greatest contemporary ballerina, faced the end of her career as a principal dancer with the New York City Ballet after a hip injury required surgery and months of rehabilitation and physical therapy. Against the odds, she was able to return to the company in the spring of 2014 and then gave her final performance that fall. Retirement was inevitable even without the injury. 47 is considered old for a ballet dancer, and her style of contemporary ballet was like an extreme sport. While dancing, she seemed to defy both the law of gravity and the physical limitations of the human body. Retiring was a personal and professional crisis. Her life, her work, her identity revolved around the New York City Ballet, which she had danced with for 30 years. She's lucky. She can still dance in spite of the injuries she sustained. But now she does contemporary dance. A new documentary called Restless Creature covers the period of her life from her surgery to her final bow at the ballet. Restless Creature is also the name of the first independent dance project that she performed. In the fall, she'll tour with new works choreographed for her in a project called Some of a Thousand Words. Wendy Whalen, welcome to Fresh Air. I know leaving the New York City Ballet was very difficult for you. It had been your life, your identity. Did it make it any easier to have a camera crew documenting that period of your life and being public about it, making it something interesting and worthy of sharing, something other people, dancers and other people, would identify with? That's a great question. Um, It was a very difficult time. I did not want to make the film originally when it came my way. Um, I didn't want to share this very unknown um, part of my life, unknown to me, um, complicated and confusing and very vulnerable. Um, But I was sort of talked into it. I, I was talked into trying it. And I liked the footage that I saw. And I liked the directors and filmmakers that I was working with. And the, the, especially the cameraman. He had done dance films before, so it was very comfortable. He knew exactly how to move in the studio or wherever I was with me. And because it was such a difficult time, it turned into a supportive thing in a way. It was at times irritating to have a camera crew around me, but at the same time, it pushed me to bear myself, open my story up, um, and to do it with confidence and to do it in a creative way. Was it was it a kind of a preventive against wallowing? <laughs> he, I think it kind of turned into that. Yeah, it was a, it was a support. It turned into that in a, way, a weird way. My impression is you felt you might have been violating an unspoken ballet rule, which is that ballet dancers don't reveal their difficulties. Exactly. Where does exactly. that come from? Like, what is that about? I don't know. Um, it's this ideal of perfection of. Um, 
otherworldliness of power and strength and confidence. That's what we try to emit on the stage in performance. Um, in the studio, we have to, you know, be devoted with discipline and focus. Um, you know, their humor comes in, creativity comes in, and there's quite a bit of mess, but we don't want to show that to an audience. So that's part of the game. That's part of the thrill of it, um, to be a ballet dancer. And here you were on camera showing physical <laughs> problems, showing pain. Yeah. One of the hard things for me to do was to show my limp to the camera um, and to show myself crying. I, 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 I'm not a crying kind of person anyway. And I, I knew that you know, the camera people wanted some tears every once in a while. They wanted the reality. They wanted me to viscerally show what I was feeling, and it was very hard for me to do that. Um, the, the very few times I cried through the whole experience, it's in the film. So, um, But I was, you know, embarrassed about my limp, um, and there was a time that happened um, probably halfway through the filming where I had difficulty walking, my leg wouldn't accept the weight without a buckle. And so dancing was uh, a, a really big question. <laughs> and um, that was really hard for me to show. And I actually took a break from the filming at that moment. I needed to get some epidurals in my back. And I just was like, I, I just need some space. And mm -hmm. I, I actually learned how to meditate during that time. I just had the cameras leave. And because um, that, that was just too much for me to show that I... I couldn't walk. What were your biggest worries about what your life would be like if you couldn't dance again? Well, I didn't want to lose the the voice I had physically, the mode of expression that I had, and and the, especially letting go the level of the expression that I had and changing the level. Um, I knew it so well. You know, it's just like having a voice or having a talent at writing and then losing a part of that, losing um, a vocal cord or losing access to your, you know, hand to write it down. It just, it was terrifying to lose that mode of expression that I was so in touch with, that I so loved, that I so cultivated for my whole entire life. And it was your entire life. I mean, I mean, that that was dancing was and, and still is your, your, your life. Yeah, I started when I was three. Mm -hmm. And I retired at ballet at 47, but I'm 50 now and I just took class and I did yoga this morning and I moved my body and and I felt good. So I was happy about that. That's nice to hear. So yeah. once you realized after your hip surgery and after the rehabilitation and physical therapy, mm -hmm. once you realized you could dance again... But it was time to leave the extreme dance of the New York City Ballet. Did it right. change your identity to leave the New York City Ballet? You'd been with that ballet for 30 years. That, I mean, that was your, you were a principal. That was really like your identity. And it's it, one of the it, most famous ballet yes. companies in the world. Yeah. I, I, I moved to New York from Louisville, Kentucky when I was 15. My ultimate focus was, was the New York City Ballet, getting in, hopefully, and thriving in that company, and um, and I did. I was there as a an apprentice when I was seventeen, um, joined when I was nineteen, and grew up there. I, you know, everything I experienced <laughs> as an adult happened as a member of New York City Ballet, so it all connects to that place. So to leave it as an adult, um, going into it as basically a child was scary, really scary. Yeah, I mean, like, who are you if you're not the principal of the New York City Ballet? Yeah, and, you know, they give us our, our um, schedule a day or two days before, so I know every day what I'm supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And leaving New York City Ballet, the world doesn't do that for me. You know, I have to do that myself. <laughs> so that was huge, you know, to sort of let myself know, oh, well, if you want to sleep in, you can sleep in. You know, that was like, what? <laughs> you know, it's just letting go and and releasing and relaxing a little bit was huge. It was but, letting go hard? I mean, was that so, well, something you, you know, didn't I've really been, know how to do? I've been strapped in 
you know, physically strapped in to point shoes, strapped into a leotard and tights. My hair has been strapped up for my whole entire life. And to untie the shoes, um, I don't wear a leotard anymore. I wear a T-shirt and I wear pants. I don't wear tights. I generally wear my hair looser and or, or even in a braid now. Um, I wear socks on my feet. I don't like to be constricted now, but that was safe then. I was terrified to be unconstricted, and now I don't know another way I'd rather be. So, yeah, it was from one extreme finding the safety in the other. When you were describing how you dress, are you talking about on stage or off? Both, on stage and off. I, I wake up. I go to class at 10, 10 10.30 in the morning. I have a leotard on and tights on and shoes, and my hair is up. And I spend that day like that until, you know, I rehearse all day. Then I go and do a performance, and everything becomes a little bit tighter, you know, (laughs) including the nervous system. So everything's on a a high ladder of like... (sighs) You know, I've got to, I've got to succeed. I, I can't falter. I have to, you know, make that step happen. I have to feel in the zone um, in front of 3,000 people tonight. And then coming off of that from a performance is, it takes a while. Your adrenaline is pumped and you calm down and maybe you go to sleep at midnight or one or if you can't sleep because you're nervous later than that. And then you get up and you do it all again the next day. I did that for decades. Um, and I don't consider myself a ballerina now. Um, I'm a former ballerina now, so there's some of it still in there, but I don't uh, um, try to attain what I was in the same way anymore. I've given it up. I've let it go, and it's life, and we all have to do that at some point. And it's hard sometimes to do it in our culture because I think people are ashamed of getting older. It's it, yeah, they're shame, definitely. Pe- people don't hide their age the way they used to because it's pointless. All anybody needs to do is go on Google. So why, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. why bother to hide it? But yeah. but still, I think people are very often very self conscious about their age, especially in professions where you're judged by your age, and that covers a mm-hmm. lot of professions. But when you're judged visually by your age, I mean, I think sure yeah. that's one of the reasons why so many people get cosmetic surgery. You know, mm, yeah. I've always been, I mean, I've always been proud. I've always been, well, I'm this old. I've never lied about my age. And I've, mm-hmm. you know, so. And, yeah, but, 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 and, but at the ballet, it must have been like, well, I don't know. She's like, she's 45 now. When, she's, when is she going to retire? Ex- How much it, more does she have left? Did you feel that from people? I, you know, I heard later in my career, that my boss say, well, you're going to outlast some of your, your colleagues. Just physically, I can tell. Um, and so I was revved up about that. I felt confident. Yeah, I am. You know, I sure am. And and I did. But then at the same time, he's the one that said, okay, now maybe you should rethink doing this particular role or this particular thing. And, you know, and so, you know, he's kind of the master of, of time, Mr. Time. <laughs> What was your mix between anger and gratitude? <laughs> he told me, um, maybe it's no longer time for you to be doing this role. And I think the role he was talking about was in The Nutcracker, which you'd done every year. Yeah. I was surprised. I went into the meeting thinking it was about something else. I had no idea that this was going to come up. Um, and this was a meeting I with certainly... the ballet master, Peter Martins. Yeah. And because I hadn't had any real pain in my body. I mean, I knew I wasn't 28 anymore. But at the same time, I didn't, I wasn't feeling pain and or boredom. I still felt inspired. And um, so when it happened, I was like, what? Are you serious? It shocked me. And then it hurt really, really bad. And I cried a lot for a while. Um, And I think the shock was was what hurt the most because I didn't expect it. How long after that meeting did you get injured? Um, That happened in, I think, October 2011. And by um, January 2012, I had pain. 
Mm-hmm. So two months, and the pain never stopped in different areas of my body for four years. <laughs> wow, it's a long time to be in pain. Yeah, yeah. Let's take a short break here, and then we'll talk some more. If you're just joining us, my guest is Wendy Whalen, who was a principal dancer with the New York City Ballet for 30 years. She retired from the company in 2014 after making a comeback following a hip injury. The new documentary, Restless Creature, is about that period of her life. We'll be back after a break. This is Fresh Air. Support for NPR and the following message come from Exxon and Mobil, the exclusive fuel partners of the Plenty Rewards Program. 500 points is worth at least $5 in savings. You can pick up a Plenty card at an Exxon or Mobil branded station and start earning points right away. How did you get the hip injury that led to your pain and to your surgery? Came out of nowhere. Literally came out of nowhere. I um I slipped. On, ironically, September 11th, <laughs> 2012. And um, I knew something had happened. I, it was the smallest slip. and um, But I felt it deep in my the back of my hip hamstring area. And I thought, oh, I tore my hamstring. Or I pulled my ham. I didn't imagine it would be a tear. And I couldn't do certain dances that season. I did some. I didn't do the ones I was really well known for and wanted to do. And I waited a few months, um, didn't stretch it, still danced, but just at a certain level. And then within three months, I couldn't close fifth position. And with fifth position, if you don't know ballet, is the base of ballet. It's the most basic position that everything moves from. And I literally couldn't do that. So that was a big shock. And I tried everything. I tried acupuncture. I tried, I was going to therapy. I tried massage. I tried I, everything you can imagine. I had injections, um, MRIs. Um, and then the MRI came back and said there was inflammation in my hip. So I had my hip drained and the doctor also did an ultrasound and he said, oh, I see a complex labral tear. And I was like, a tear? What do you mean a tear? How could I get a tear? <laughs> you know. And I'm sure the tear was there forever. I just didn't know it and until it was discovered and it, or it had gotten to a place that it was um, needing to be fixed. So I contemplated surgery, I contemplated everything I could do to avoid surgery and ultimately about mm, eight months later, I was on the operating table getting a reconstructive surgery. The doctor didn't know to what degree the hip injury was when I went into the surgery. And um, a, a one and a half hour, two hour surgery ended up being a four hour surgery. And uh, after the surgery, I was, uh, I couldn't wait bare for two months. I was on crutches for two months. And I was um, very often in a, a machine that kept my, uh, the circulation going in my leg so that we could try to build new cartilage, grow new cartilage. Um, so I did the best I could do to rehabilitate myself and um, got back slowly and still had troubles and uh, trying to figure it out. Nine months later, I got back on stage um, and then performed a few more months, and then I retired from the New York City Ballet. How did it change your relationship to your body, hmm. to be in pain, and to not know if your body was going to work properly again? Your body is your source, uh, the source of your pride, the source of your work, the source of your identity as a dancer, and it's also just like your home. I mean, we all live in our bodies, but your yeah. body is like a, a very special body. Definitely. It was my home. It was my best friend. <laughs> you know, and we could talk, we could fight, and uh, we always found way to make peace um, throughout my career. Um, you know, it started to tell me what to do, and I stopped demanding from it. So I had to soften up and empathize with my body and have a little more compassion for it and be grateful for what it did give me, which was a 
phenomenal 30-year career with arguably the best company in the world. How much of your movement have you gotten back, and are you still in, in pain? Um, I ultimately, the, the, my sur- first surgeon, which is the surgery in the film, um, Dr. Philippon, he said to me, he said, you know, it's quite extensive damage you've done in there over the years, and uh, it's, it's quite bad. So we've done everything we can to bring it back. I don't know how long it's going to last, but ultimately you will probably need a replacement of the joint at some point. I don't know, down the line. And uh, two years later I did get that replacement, and um, heaven on earth. I recommend it to everyone. Um, I got pain-free immediately, and uh, I have a majority of my flexibility back. And I'm doing yoga now, and I do uh, gyrotonics, and and all that has helped me um, sort of open up and find a new way of moving and uh, release the hold that I had as a ballerina, you know, you, you put your, your claws in and you hold on to it because it can go any second. A new dancer could come along, you can lose your, your place in line. You know, all these things that had developed over 30 years. And uh, so releasing of the claws kind of physically um, and opening up my body to a new way of moving, my brain to a new way of thinking about what I do um, has ultimately given peace to my body and um and reinvigorated it given it new oxygen and uh and i'm thrilled with what i can do right now so that's great to hear my guest is dancer wendy whalen the new documentary about her is called restless creature after a break we'll talk about how her approach to ballet was like an extreme sport defying the law of gravity and the limitations of the human body I'm Terry Gross, and this is Fresh Air. Support for this podcast and the following message come from Swell Investing, an impact investing platform that aims to deliver profit as well as purpose. Swell identifies high-growth potential companies that are working to solve today's biggest challenges like clean water, disease eradication, and renewable energy. Now people can invest in portfolios of stocks that align with their values. This is impact investing. It's also good business. Invest in progress at swellinvesting.com. You know, a lot of people think of ballet as being um, the ultimate in, like, femininity. You know, like (laughs) a a pink kind of femininity, like frilly, the tutu. Mm -hmm. Your approach at New York City Ballet was... uh, it's almost like more of an extreme sport. I mean, you got your yeah. body into shapes and angles and doing jumps and getting lifted in ways that truly seem to defy the laws of gravity and defy the laws of what the body is physically capable of. Um, would you describe a little, for people who have not seen you dance, some of the things that you did that w- were so uh, typical for you but not typical for others? Right. Well, I can take it back to when I was a kid. Um, I was a, a very athletic child, very uh, energetic child, and that's why I started dancing. Was, was, I had a little too much energy. <laughs> My mom said, let's get the middle one, the middle child out of the house in the afternoon and let's stick her somewhere where she can release that energy. So she put me into ballet. And, um, and my mom was a basketball coach, a college women's basketball coach, so very serious uh, basketball family. Um, I wanted to be an athlete first. Um, I wanted to also be an artist. I was really good at drawing, and I wanted to. Be, I wanted to either grow up and be an athlete or an artist. Unbeknownst to me, ballet was both. <laughs> and again, when I very first saw the Nutcracker, the dance that appealed to me was not the Sugar Plum Fairy. It was not the Waltz of the Flowers. It was the Arabian dance. It was the muscular, the the sinuous, um, more almost modern dance of the Nutcracker. That's the part I wanted to be. I didn't care for the pinkness of ballet. I never did. I was drawn immediately as a student at the School of American Ballet to seeing my first performances of the New York City Ballet. My first ballets that I loved were the Stravinsky ballets. And a lot of those Stravinsky ballets have a plucky quality or a pulled out quality or a very 
angular quality, something that's not soft, something that's not um, voluptuous in a feminine kind of way. It's voluptuous in a geometrical kind of way. So Mm -hmm. geometry, athleticism, stark angles, that's me. (laughs) One of the, and I I actually forget which dance this is, so forgive me, but Mm -hmm. um, you do a thing with your partner. So like your partner is kind of lifting you as you do a kind of cartwheel, a slow cartwheel in the air, making a full circle with your legs almost uh, uh-huh. in a complete split as you're doing it. Right. Yeah. And that looks like an incredibly uh-huh. physically challenging thing to do, yet you make it seem so effortless. And it looks like you're just kind of floating, but you're not. I mean, gravity still <laughs> exists when you're on stage. It doesn't stop for right. you. <laughs> so mm-hmm. can you talk about that, what you're physically yeah. doing in that particular move? Yeah, that ballet you're you're talking of is called Polyphonia, and it was made on um, Jock Soto and myself and um, three other couples from the New York City Ballet around the year 2001 by um, a young choreographer at the time named Christopher Wielden. He chose Jock and I to sort of be the central figures of this ballet. I guess we have two duets, um, two very potent duets in this piece. And he chose us to sort of collaborate on it with him. And we made that duet in one day. (laughs) It was like magic happened. We just, the three of us got together. We got this music. We had ideas. Chris's ideas led to sort of a conversation back to him. And he decided yes or no. And it just unfolded like origami. And basically the duet is like origami. It's folds and openings and taking one movement and flipping it into another shape, into another shape, into a kaleidoscopic unfolding of movements. And um, that's the very last moment of the piece. Um, And I always felt like I was a a switchblade in that moment. Could you describe to the extent that you could describe this kind of thing, what you're doing physically at that moment? Well, Jock, my partner, Jock Soto, he's one of the greatest partners in ballet of all time. And uh, he was like a magician. And luckily for me, I got to partner with him for about 15 years. And uh, he's holding me in a certain way. And he lifts me up like a jackknife from under my hips, under my my, my bottom, <laughs> sort of taking my, my, my hips high up into the air. And my legs are in a jackknife position. And he drops me back down. And he kneels at the same time. And one leg stays attached to his leg and the other leg does a whole a 360 around that leg that thigh that I'm laying on um and I'm just I'm holding on to my my foot and I'm just sort of doing a back dive holding on to my front foot back bending with his support rotating cartwheeling backwards catching myself on the floor with my hands letting my legs follow me and sliding under his leg and to a kneel and he kneels behind me and we both look at the audience and the lights fade and it's just really like cool <laughs> and how does it physically feel does it feel like wow this is hard I'm really exerting no. myself or does it feel no. as fluid as it looks it feels heavenly it feels like magic mm-hmm. it feels like it like there's no other place I'd rather be than making that movement right there then Mm-hmm. Yeah. What's the importance of ballet shoes when you're a ballerina? Like having, like, the exact right shoe. Uh, you mean, like, the point shoe? Yeah. Uh, the mm-hmm. one where you go up on your toe? The one where you go up uh, on your toes, yeah. <laughs> it needs to fit like a glove. So it really needs to... F- to you, we practice pointing our feet, working, exercising our feet so that we can articulate um, the joints in the feet and the and create... Um, shapes, um, sculpting the feet, um, because that's a huge part of our expression, um, the footwork. So when you get on a point shoe, uh, you want to be able to follow through with that articulation and not have it break the line or break the movement or break your ability to express to the utmost with that foot. I think most dancers now start point work at 12 or so, and 
all the way through your childhood and your and your young years, you're trying to get that right shoe to fit you just right and to make your foot shape just right. So it's honest, true, strong, powerful, gorgeous. Um, so and you you know we you, they're handmade, and you have to find the right maker to make the shoe that you like that fits you right. Hopefully, by the time you're a professional. You, you know what you want and you know how to design it on your foot and you know what to ask for. Let's take a short break here and then we'll talk okay. some more. If you're just joining us, my guest is Wendy Whalen. She was a principal with the New York City Ballet for 30 years. She retired from the company in 2014 after having made a comeback following a hip injury. And now she's doing contemporary dance. There's a new documentary about her called Restless Creature. We'll be back after a break. This is Fresh Air. Thanks for listening to Fresh Air. If you're looking for another podcast to listen to, check out Hidden Brain. Each week, Hidden Brain explores why we behave like we do. Like, why are some people great at recognizing faces? Why do some of us lie more than others? Host Shankar Vedantam delves into the latest research to get answers to these and other questions. You can find Hidden Brain on the NPR One app or wherever you get your podcasts. So you started dancing at the age of three? Yes. And by 12, you were diagnosed with scoliosis. How severe was it? Um, severe enough that the doctors wanted to treat me for it with um, traction, body casting, and ultimately a Milwaukee brace. So they wanted to halt the curve because if they didn't halt the curve when they found it, the curve probably would have... Um, accelerated to a place where I would have needed surgery, which ultimately would not have allowed me to have a ballet career. So we caught it really right at the crux of it either getting worse without treatment or halting and and uh, responding to treatment. And being a dancer uh, was a great thing. The doctor told me back then, he said, the best things for scoliosis, this was in 1979 or 1980, um, are swimming and ballet. I was like, great. And therefore, my body was flexible enough that it re- really responded to the treatment quickly. I grew an inch and a half after a week of traction in the hospital, and the doctors were thrilled. And that really kind of pulled me away from the surgery side of things, whereas one of my, my hospital roommate didn't get so lucky, and she ended up having to get a, a rod in her spine. So when you had to wear a body cast, mm-hmm. how did mm-hmm. how did you keep up with dancing? <laughs> well, I was in a fifteen pound body cast. Um, so imagine one of those down vests that you can get at North Face, or one of the basically that made out of plaster was what I lived in for. It ended up being a month at a time over five months one summer, and. In between each casting, I would go back into the hospital and spend a week in traction with a head halter on and leather straps holding my hips down towards the base of the bed and 12 pounds pulling on my head on this head halter. So um, as uncomfortable as that was, it really helped me straighten out my back. And then I would go into this body cast for a month at a time. And my teacher said to me at the time, living in Louisville, Kentucky, she said, You know, you've done so well, and I don't want you to lose your focus during this treatment right now. So I want you to come into the studio in your body cast, and I want you to to try to do whatever you can do. We don't expect you to do this. We don't expect you to do that. But just feel it out. Move your body. Keep your brain focused on what we're talking about in the class so that you just stay connected. And um, that was paramount. That shaped my whole life. In talking about your early career, you've said that you didn't think of yourself as beautiful, and ballerinas are supposed Mm -hmm. to be beautiful. You thought of getting your nose redone. Mm -hmm. What what was your thought process like in trying to decide whether to do that or not? And I'll say here, you rejected the idea of getting work done on your face. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't really know my beauty. I was a tomboy kid. I didn't have a family that, you know, makeup was, you know, part of our family. It just wasn't. And even my teachers were like, oh, don't don't wear makeup. Go to New York and let them make you. 
And the minute I got to New York, they were like, put lipstick on. <laughs> Here's some mascara. You know, um, let's fix you. Because, <laughs> you know, I didn't, I just didn't know. And I, and I, I let them shape me. And again, I also learned about my beauty through Balanchine's work and how I fit into his ballets, what qualities I had in his work um, physically, within my face, uh, within my musculature. Yeah, it took time for me. It wasn't a natural thing that I just, oh, here's my hairdo and here's my makeup. <laughs> you know, years and years of other dancers, older dancers, let me try your makeup tonight, Wendy. Come to my makeup spot and I'll do your makeup tonight. So I, I, literally my big sisters, these girls at the ballet, were trying to help me for years, like, oh, you know, you this, you shouldn't do this. <laughs> this would be better for you. And and over time, they, they sculpted me. His, Balanchine's dancers taught me how to do my makeup. They taught me how to find my way into the repertory. They, you know, those people who were his people shaped who I became. The documentary about you, the new documentary, Restless Creature, ends with an excerpt of your final New York City ballet performance. And then when, when you take your bow, like, everybody's coming up with a bouquet of roses. You have so many bouquets of roses at some point, you put them down, <laughs> and they, they just look like too, they're bigger than you are. <laughs> yeah. They look like too heavy to even carry at some point. Yeah. What was it like waking up the next day? Do you remember that? <laughs> it was funny. Um, yeah, my niece was there. She, she was, I think, three or four at the time. And uh, we were pretending with a cat toy that we were fishing. You know, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm in retirement now. I'm fishing, <laughs> you know. It's <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, and even on stage, I just felt like, you know, I was, I, ba I think I bowed for nearly a half an hour. I don't remember quite how long, but people were like, you were bowed a long time at the end <laughs> of your show. And I just, I felt slowly like I was taking a skin off, like uh, this kind of snake skin. Like, I am now me. And you're seeing me, the goofy Wendy, just I'm not trying to be who you all thought I was for so long. You know, I'm just, uh, you know, just this girl. And I jumped like a little kid, you know, a little bit. And I I had like bad posture and I was like walking like a normal person in, in, in my <laughs> bows. And I was like, yep, I'm just a human being, you know, and I've been this the whole time, but I haven't been able to show it. Did it feel like there was a big gap between how you saw yourself as, like, just Wendy and how you saw yourself on stage? A little bit, yeah. I mean, the the, the process of, of letting go was a couple of years in the making. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I worked for those years to get to that last show and be able to, to retire with grace and not a bitterness or... A sadness, mm -hmm. but with uh, a humility and a gratitude. And that was, you know, that came from Wendy the human being. Yeah, so I, I, I got there. There's a moment in the film where you talk about how you can't watch the New York City Ballet because it's just too painful since you can't dance at that point. You're still oh, recovering. Yeah. So, Well, that was, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. But do you, do you still have to deal at all with you know, envy or, um, mm -mm. no, like when no. you see like young dancers or when you look yeah. at the dancers in the New York City Ballet, do you, yeah. do you wish like you, you could be back there, that you could be no. that again? Mm -mm. I did it. I did it. And I'm so proud of how I did it. And I'm proud of how I let it go. And I'm excited for these people that are in it now, loving it, living it, being it, finding themselves. I'm finding myself in a new, different place mm -hmm. now, which is exciting. Um, I would never want to go back, no. Why not? Into time? Yeah. Ah, uh, because I'm fascinated with where I'm at now. Um, I've grown beyond it. You know, I've done it. I lived it. experienced it. I learned to let it go, which was a great learning spiritual learning exp experience for me as a person um and now um all this new all these new challenges all these 
new question marks, all this new stuff I've never done, um, the fear, the anxiety, the excitement, um, the rela- release um, of it, the way, the new way I can approach it uh, with with where I'm at now. Um, that's fascinating to me now. Well, I can't tell you how much I <laughs> admire you. Thank you so much for talking with us. It's really been great to talk with you. Thank you. It's been a thrill. There's a new documentary about Wendy Whalen. It's called Restless Creature. In the fall, Whalen will tour with new works choreographed for her in a project called Some of a Thousand Words. After we take a short break, book critic Maureen Corrigan will review a novel just published in the U.S. that's already won three major literary awards in England. This is Fresh Air. Support for this podcast and the following message come from Morgan Stanley. For more than 80 years, Morgan Stanley has offered financial wisdom to its clients. And for the last few weeks, they've been offering financial wisdom on a brand new podcast. The Morgan Stanley Ideas Podcast will answer some questions you've wondered about for years and others you didn't even know you had. Find out on the Morgan Stanley Ideas Podcast, available from your favorite podcast directory. Morgan Stanley Smith Barney LLC and Morgan Stanley and Co LLC members SIPIC. Our book critic Maureen Corrigan has a review of Francis Bufford's new novel Golden Hill, which has already swept up three major literary awards in Great Britain, where it was published last year. A novel set in 18th century New York, Golden Hill has been described as rollicking, frolicsome, and swashbuckling. Maureen has a few more adjectives to add. Here's her review. Ever since Peter Minuet bought Manhattan Island from the Native Americans, New York City's character has been defined by money and con artistry. So it is that classic New York stories are always populated by a grifter or two. Francis Spufford is a Brit, but he knows this cardinal rule of writing New York— His ingenious historical novel, called Golden Hill, is set in 1746, when spies, thieves, card sharks, and crooked bankers jostle the innocent in the teeming streets of what's now Lower Manhattan. It's a place of dark alleys and twisted virtue, where Damon Runyon's Nicely Nicely and Angie the Ox would have felt right at home. The opening scene of Golden Hill is also ripped out of the classic New York story handbook. On a gloomy November evening, a ship sails into the harbor, and a stranger disembarks. He's a handsome young Englishman named Mr. Smith, and he quickly makes his way to a counting house on Golden Hill Street. There, he presents a bill from London investors demanding payment of a thousand pounds. The chief merchant of the counting house is suspicious. Is Smith legit, or is he a con artist presenting a forged document? In any case, the counting house doesn't have enough money at hand. This is early New York, where a hectic variety of colonial notes, along with wampum, tobacco tickets, rum by the gallon, and, of course, slaves, serve as money substitutes. As Smith says to himself, it was all money in a world without money. Stranded in the city until matters can be sorted out, Smith becomes the object of fierce interest, both romantic and political. Rumors swirl that Smith may be funding an opposition movement to the Crown. On his first morning in the city, while he's eating in a coffee house, Smith is warned, as many an out-of-towner since has been, that New York isn't the city for him. This is a place, says Smith's new acquaintance, where things can get out of hand very quick. You would think, talking to the habitants, that all the vices and crimes of humanity had been left behind on the other shore. But the truth is, the people here are wild, suspicious, combustible, and the devil to govern. In all their relations, they are prompt to peer and gaze for the hidden motive, the worm in the apple— the serpent in the garden, they insist their new world to be. 
Before his adventures end, Smith will get a personal tour of the city's taverns, theaters, and debtors' prison. He'll be pressured to take part in society dinners, dances, and a duel. Ultimately, the mystery of Smith's identity will turn out to be as multi-layered as that of old New York itself. Traditional historical novels are out of fashion these days. Most contemporary writers who tell stories about the past prefer to tell them slant, that is, riddled with intrusions of skepticism and fantasy, as, say, Colson Whitehead and George Saunders both do in their latest superb novels. Even Spufford himself has fiddled around with trickier techniques of writing about the past. His book, Red Plenty, falls into that gray zone between novel and nonfiction. But Golden Hill is so gorgeously crafted, so intelligent and entertaining, it makes a case for the enduring vitality of the more straightforward historical novel. Spufford's sprawling recreation here is pitch perfect, down to single sentences that can stretch exuberantly to a page, as well as a comic narrator who directly apologizes to readers when events get too bawdy or bloody. Midway through the novel, Mr. Smith writes a letter to his father back in England. I want to end by quoting a line from that letter, because it so aptly describes the way Golden Hill draws readers into another world. Smith writes to his father, If it were in my power, I would take this paper on whose other side you seem to sit now, whatever the months and miles between, and tear a hole in it so cunningly that I might fold it out into a door in the air through which I could step and at once be at home with you. Golden Hill itself is that door in the air. Give yourself a treat and step through. Maureen Corrigan teaches literature at Georgetown University. She reviewed Golden Hill, a novel of old New York by Francis Spufford. Tomorrow on Fresh Air, why was only one corporate executive convicted after the financial meltdown of... Favorite podcast directory. Morgan Stanley Smith Barney LLC and Morgan Stanley & Co. LLC. Members SIPC. Our book critic Maureen Corrigan has a review of Francis Spufford's new novel, Golden Hill, which has already swept up three major literary awards in Great Britain, where it was published last year. A novel set in 18th century New York, Golden Hill has been described as rollicking, frolicsome, and swashbuckling. Maureen has a few more adjectives to add. Here's her review. Ever since Peter Minuet bought Manhattan Island from the Native Americans, New York City's character has been defined by money and con artistry. So it is that classic New York stories are always populated by a grifter or two. Francis Spufford is a Brit, but he knows this cardinal rule of writing New York. His ingenious historical novel, called Golden Hill, is set in 1746, when spies, thieves, card sharks, and crooked bankers jostle the innocent in the teeming streets of what's now Lower Manhattan. It's a place of dark alleys and twisted virtue, where Damon Runyon's Nicely Nicely and Angie the Ox would have felt right at home. The opening scene of Golden Hill is also ripped out of the classic New York story handbook. On a gloomy November evening, a ship sails into the harbor, and a stranger disembarks. He's a handsome young Englishman named Mr. Smith, and he quickly makes his way to a counting house on Golden Hill Street. There, he presents a bill from London investors demanding payment of a thousand pounds. The chief merchant of the counting house is suspicious. Is Smith legit, or is he a con artist presenting a forged document? In any case, the counting house doesn't have enough money at hand. This is early New York, where a hectic variety of colonial notes, along with wampum, tobacco tickets, rum by the gallon, and, of course, slaves, serve as money substitutes. 
As Smith says to himself, it was all money in a world without money. Stranded in the city until matters can be sorted out, Smith becomes the object of fierce interest, both romantic and political. Rumors swirl that Smith may be funding an opposition movement to the Crown. On his first morning in the city, while he's eating in a coffee house, Smith is warned, as many an out-of-towner since has been, that New York isn't the city for him. This is a place, says Smith. From WHYY in Philadelphia, I'm Terry Gross with Fresh Air. Today, life after ballet for one of America's most acclaimed dancers. Wendy Whalen retired from the New York City Ballet at the age of 47 after a hip injury. She wasn't sure she'd ever dance again, but after reconstructive surgery and months of physical therapy, she briefly returned to the dance company that had been her home for 30 years. The new documentary, Restless Creature, focuses on that period when her identity was shattered. Now she does contemporary dance and finds her new life liberating. I've been strapped in, you know, physically. Strapped in to point shoes, strapped into a leotard and tights. My hair has been strapped up for my whole entire life. I don't like to be constricted now, but that was safe then. Also, Maureen Corrigan reviews a new novel set in 18th century New York. That's coming up on Fresh Air. Hey there, Paula Poundstone here. I hate to interrupt, but maybe you might like to listen to my new show, live from the Poundstone Institute, where I talk to researchers about interesting studies. It's like hidden brain, except our brains are really well hidden. Find it now on the NPR One app and wherever you listen to podcasts. Most dancers and athletes face a similar predicament. Their careers are virtually over in their late 30s or 40s. And then what? At the age of 47, my guest Wendy Whalen, who was described in the New York Times as America's greatest contemporary ballerina, faced the end of her career as a principal dancer with the New York City Ballet after a hip injury required surgery and months of rehabilitation and physical therapy. Against the odds, she was able to return to the company in the spring of 2014 and then gave her final performance that fall. Retirement was inevitable even without the injury. 47 is considered old for a ballet dancer, and her style of contemporary ballet was like an extreme sport. While dancing, she seemed to defy both the law of gravity and the physical limitations of the human body. Retiring was a personal and professional crisis. Her life, her work, her identity revolved around the New York City Ballet, which she had danced with for 30 years. She's lucky. She can still dance in spite of the injuries she sustained. But now she does contemporary dance. A new documentary called Restless Creature covers the period of her life from her surgery to her final bow at the ballet. Restless Creature is also the name of the first independent dance project that she performed. In the fall, she'll tour with New Works choreographed for her in a project called Some of a Thousand Words. Wendy Whalen, welcome to Fresh Air. I know leaving the New York City Ballet was very difficult for you. It had been your life, your identity. Did it make it any easier to have a camera? The doctor didn't know to what degree the hip injury was when I went into the surgery, and um, a a one-and-a-half-hour, two-hour surgery ended up being a four-hour surgery. And uh, after the surgery, I was uh, I couldn't wait bare for two months. I was on crutches for two months, and I was um, very often in a, a machine that kept my uh, the circulation going in my leg so that we could try to build new cartilage, grow new cartilage. Um, so I did the best I could do to rehabilitate myself and... Um, got back slowly and still had troubles and uh, trying to figure it out. Nine months later, I got back on stage um, and then performed a few more months, and then I retired from the New York City Ballet. How did it change your relationship to your body, to Hmm. be in pain and to not know if your body was going to work properly again? Your body is your source Uh, the source of your pride, the source of your work, the source of your identity as a dancer. And it's also just like your home. I mean, we all live in our bodies, but your body was like a a very special body. 
Definitely. It was my home. It was my best friend. <laughs> you know, and we could talk, we could fight, and uh, we always found way to make peace um, throughout my career. Um, you know, it started to tell me what to do, and I stopped demanding from it. So I had to soften up and empathize with my body and have a little more compassion for it and be grateful for what it did give me, which was a phenomenal 30-year career with arguably the best company in the world. How much of your movement have you gotten back, and are you still in, in pain? Um, I ultimately, the, the, my sur first surgeon, which is the surgery in the film, um, Dr. Philippon, he said to me, he said, you know, there's quite extensive damage you've done in there over the years, and uh, it's, it's quite bad. So we've done everything we can to bring it back. I don't know how long it's going to last, but ultimately you will probably need a replacement of the joint at some point. I don't know, down the line. And uh, two years later I did get that replacement, and um, heaven on earth. I recommend it to everyone. Um, I got pain-free immediately. And uh, I have a majority of my flexibility back. And I'm doing yoga now, and I do uh, gyrotonics. And, and all that has helped me um, sort of, and I was um, very often in a, a machine that kept my uh, the circulation going in my leg so that we could try to build new cartilage, grow new cartilage. Um, so I did the best I could do to rehabilitate myself and, um, got back slowly and still had troubles and, uh, trying to figure it out. Nine months later, I got back on stage, um, and then performed a few more months and then I retired from the New York City Ballet. How did it change your relationship to your body to be in pain and to not know if your body was going to work properly again. Your body is your source, uh, the source of your pride, the source of your work, the source of your identity as a dancer. And it's also just like your home. I mean, we all live in our bodies, but your yeah. body was like a, a very special body. Definitely. It was my home. It was my best friend. <laughs> you know, and we could talk, we could fight, and uh, we always found way to make peace. Um throughout my career, um, you know, it started to tell me what to do, and I stopped demanding from it. So I had to soften up and empathize with my body and have a little more compassion for it and be grateful for what it did give me, which was a phenomenal 30-year career with arguably the best company in the world. How much of your movement have you gotten back, and are you still in, in pain? Um, I ultimately, the, the, my sur first surgeon, which is the surgery in the film, um, Dr. Philippon, he said to me, he said, you know, there's quite extensive damage you've done in there over the years, and uh, it's, it's quite bad. So we've done everything we can to bring it back. I don't know how long it's going to last. But ultimately, you will probably need a replacement of the joint at some point. I don't know, down the line. And uh, two years later, I did get that replacement. And um, heaven on earth, I recommend it to everyone. Um, I got pain-free immediately. And uh, I have a majority of my flexibility back. And I'm doing yoga now, and I do uh, gyrotonics, and, and all that has helped me um, sort of open up and find a new way of moving and uh, release the hold that I had as a ballerina. You know, you, you put your, your claws in and you hold on to it because it can go any second. A new dancer could come along, you can lose your, your place. You know, I've got to I've gotta succeed. I, I can't falter. I have to, you know, make that step happen. I have to feel in the zone um, in front of 3,000 people tonight. And then coming off of that from a performance is 
takes a while. Your adrenaline is pumped and you calm down and maybe you go to sleep at midnight or one or if you can't sleep because you're nervous later than that and then you get up and you do it all again the next day. I did that for decades. Um, and I don't consider myself a ballerina now. Um, I'm a former ballerina now, so there's some of it still in there, but I don't uh, um, try to attain what I was in the same way anymore. I've given it up. I've let it go. And it's life. And we all have to do that at some point. And it's hard sometimes to do it in our culture because I think people are ashamed of getting older. It's yeah, it, they're shame, definitely. Pe- people don't hide their age the way they used to because it's pointless. All anybody needs to do is go on Google. So why, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. why bother to hide it? But yeah. but still, I think people are very often very self conscious about their age, especially in professions where you're judged by your age, and that covers a mm-hmm. lot of professions. But when you're judged visually by your age, I mean, I think, I'm sure yeah. that's one of the reasons why so many people get cosmetic surgery. You know, mm, yeah. I've always been, I mean, I've always been proud. I've always been, well, I'm this old. I've never lied about my age. And I've, mm-hmm. you know, so. And, yeah, but, 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 and, but at the ballet, it must have been like, well, I don't know. She's like, she's 45 now. When she's When is she going to retire? Ex- How much it, more does she have left? Did you feel that from people? I, you know, I heard later in my career, that my boss say, well, you're going to outlast some of your, your colleagues. Just physically, I can tell. Um, and so I was revved up about that. I felt confident. Yeah, I am. You know, I sure am. And and I did. But then at the same time, he's the one that said, okay, now maybe you should rethink doing this particular role or this particular thing. And, you know, and so, you know, he's kind of the master of, of time, Mr. Time. <laughs> What was your mix between anger and gratitude? <laughs> he told her, um, maybe it's no longer time for you to be doing this role. And I think the role he was talking about was in The Nutcracker, which you'd done every year. Yeah. I was surprised. I went into the meeting thinking it was about something else. I had no idea that this was going to come up. Um, and this was a meeting I'd with certainly... the ballet master, Peter Martins. Yeah. And because I hadn't had any real pain in my body. I mean, I knew I wasn't 28 anymore, but at the same time, but I haven't been able to show it. Did it feel like there was a big gap between how you saw yourself as like just Wendy and how you sell yourself on stage? A little bit. Yeah. I mean, the the, the process of of letting go was a couple of years in the making. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I worked for those years to get to that last show and be able to to retire with grace and not a bitterness or a sadness, mm-hmm. but with uh, a humility and a gratitude. And that was, you know, that came from Wendy the human being. Yeah, so I, I, I got there. There's a moment in the film where you talk about how you can't watch the New York City Ballet because it's just too painful since you can't dance at that point. You're still oh, recovering. Yeah. So, well, that was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. But do you, do you still have to deal at all with, you know, envy or, um, n- no? Like when no. you see like young dancers or when you look yeah. at the dancers in the New York City Ballet, do you, yeah. do you wish like you, you could be back there, that you could be no. that again? Mm-mm. I did it. I did it. And I'm so proud of how I did it. And I'm proud of how I let it go. And I'm excited for these people that are in it now, loving it, living it, being it, finding themselves. I'm finding myself in a new, different place mm-hmm. now, which is exciting. Um, I would never want to go back, no. Why not? Into time? Yeah. Ah, uh, because I'm fascinated with where I'm at now. Um, I've grown beyond it. You know, I've done it. I lived it, experienced it. I learned to let it go which was a great learning, spiritual learning experience for me as a person. Um, And now um, all this new, all these new challenges, all these new question marks, all this new stuff I've never done, um, 
the fear, the anxiety, the excitement, um, the rela- release um, of it, the way, the new way I can approach it uh, with with where I'm at now. Um, that's fascinating to me now. Well, I can't tell you how much I <laughs> admire you. Thank you so much for talking with us. It's really been great to talk with you. Thank you. It's been a thrill. There's a new documentary about Wendy Whalen. It's called Restless Creature. In the fall, Whalen will tour with new works choreographed for her in a project called Some of a Thousand Words. After we take a short break, book critic Maureen Corrigan will review a novel just published in the U.S. Now, maybe you should rethink doing this particular role or this particular thing. And, you know, and so, you know, he's kind of the master of of time, Mr. Time. (laughs) What was your mix between anger and gratitude? (laughs) He told you, Um, maybe it's no longer time for you to be doing this role. And I think the role he was talking about was in The Nutcracker, which you'd done every year yeah I was surprised I went into the meeting thinking it was about something else I had no idea that this was going to come up um, and this was a meeting I with the ballet master Peter Martins yeah and because I hadn't had any real pain in my body I mean I knew I wasn't 28 anymore but at the same time I didn't I wasn't feeling pain and or boredom I still felt inspired and um, so when it happened, I was just like, what? You, are you serious? It shocked me. And then it hurt really, really bad. And I cried a lot for a while. Um, and I think the shock was was what hurt the most because I didn't expect it. How long after that meeting did you get injured? Um, that happened in, I think, October. 2011, and by um, January 2012, I had pain. Mm -hmm. So two months, and the pain never stopped in different areas of my body for four years. (laughs) Wow, that's a long time to be in pain. Yeah. Yeah. Let's take a short break here, and then we'll talk some more. If you're just joining us, my guest is Wendy Whalen, who was a principal dancer with the New York City Ballet for 30 years. She retired from the company in 2014 after making a comeback following a hip injury. The new documentary, Restless Creature, is about that period of her life. We'll be back after a break. This is Fresh Air. Support for NPR and the following message come from Exxon and Mobil, the exclusive fuel partners of the Plenty Rewards Program. 500 points is worth at least $5 in savings. You can pick up a Plenty card at an Exxon or Mobil branded station and start earning points right away. How did you get the hip injury that led to your pain and to your surgery? Came out of nowhere. Literally came out of nowhere. I um I slipped. On, ironically, September 11th, <laughs> 2012. And um, I knew something had happened. I, it was the smallest slip. and um, But I felt it deep in my the back of my hip hamstring area. And I thought, oh, I tore my hamstring. Or I pulled my ham. I didn't imagine it would be a tear. And it was a meeting with the ballet master Peter Martins. Yeah. And because I hadn't had any real pain in my body. I mean, I knew I wasn't 28 anymore. But at the same time, I didn't, I wasn't feeling pain and or boredom. I still felt inspired. And um, so when it happened, I was just like, what? Are you serious? It shocked me. And then it hurt really, really bad. And I cried a lot for a while. Um, And I think the shock was was what hurt the most is because I didn't expect it. How long after that meeting did you get injured? Um, that happened in, I think, October 2011. And by um, January 2012, I had pain. Mm-hmm. So two months, and the pain never stopped in different areas of my body for four years. <laughs> wow, that's a long time to be in pain. Yeah, yeah. 
Let's take a short break here, and then we'll sure. talk some more. If you're just joining us, my guest is Wendy Whalen, who was a principal dancer with the New York City Ballet for 30 years. She retired from the company in 2014 after making a comeback following a hip injury. The new documentary, Restless Creature, is about that period of her life. We'll be back after a break. This is Fresh Air. Support for NPR and the following message come from Exxon and Mobil, the exclusive fuel partners of the Plenty Rewards Program. 500 points is worth at least $5 in savings. You can pick up a Plenty card at an Exxon or Mobil branded station and start earning points right away. How did you get the hip injury that led to your pain and to your surgery? Came out of nowhere. Literally came out of nowhere. I, um, I slipped on, ironically, September 11th, <laughs> 2012. And um, I knew something had happened. I, it was the smallest slip. and um, But I felt it deep in my the back of my hip hamstring area. And I thought, oh, I tore my hamstring. Or I pulled my ham. I didn't imagine it would be a tear. And I couldn't do certain dances that season. I did some. I didn't do the ones I was really well known for and wanted to do. And I waited a few months, um, didn't stretch it, still danced, but just at a certain level. And then within three months, I couldn't close fifth position. And fifth position, if you don't know ballet, is the base of ballet. It's the most basic position that everything moves from. And I literally couldn't do that. So that was a year with arguably the best company in the world. How much of your movement have you gotten back, and are you still in, in pain? Um, I ultimately, the, the, my sur- first surgeon, which is the surgery in the film, um, Dr. Philippon, he said to me, he said, you know, it's quite extensive damage you've done in there over the years, and uh, it's, it's quite bad. So we've done everything we can to bring it back. I don't know how long it's going to last, but ultimately you will probably need a replacement of the joint at some point. I don't know, down the line. And uh, two years later I did get that replacement. And um, heaven on earth, I recommend it to everyone. Um, I got pain-free immediately, and uh, I have a majority of my flexibility back and I'm doing yoga now and I do uh, gyrotonics and and all that has helped me um, sort of open up and find a new way of moving and uh, release the hold that I had as a ballerina you know you you put your your claws in and you hold on to it because it can go any second a new dancer could come along you can lose your your place in line you know all these things that had developed over 30 years and uh so releasing of the claws kind of physically um and opening up my body to a new way of moving my brain to a new way of thinking about what i do um has ultimately given peace to my body and um and reinvigorated it given it new oxygen and uh and I'm thrilled with what I can do right now. So that's great yeah. to hear. My guest is dancer Wendy Whalen. The new documentary about her is called Restless Creature. After a break, we'll talk about how her approach to ballet was like an extreme sport, defying the law of gravity and the limitations of the human body. I'm Terry Gross, and this is Fresh Air. <laughs> Support for this podcast and the following message come from Swell Investing, an impact investing platform that aims to deliver profit as well as purpose. Swell identifies high-growth potential companies that are working to solve today's biggest challenges like clean water, disease eradication, and renewable energy. Now people can invest in portfolios of stocks that align with their values. This is impact investing. It's also good business. Invest in progress at swellinvesting.com. You know, a lot of people think of ballet as being um, the ultimate in, like, femininity. You know, like, <laughs> but he knows this cardinal rule of writing New York. 
His ingenious historical novel, called Golden Hill, is set in 1746, when spies, thieves, card sharks, and crooked bankers jostle the innocent in the teeming streets of what's now Lower Manhattan. It's a place of dark alleys and twisted virtue, where Damon Runyon's Nicely Nicely and Angie the Ox would have felt right at home. The opening scene of Golden Hill is also ripped out of the classic New York story handbook. On a gloomy November evening, a ship sails into the harbor, and a stranger disembarks. He's a handsome young Englishman named Mr. Smith, and he quickly makes his way to a counting house on Golden Hill Street. There, he presents a bill from London investors demanding payment of a thousand pounds. The chief merchant of the counting house is suspicious. Is Smith legit, or is he a con artist presenting a forged document? In any case, the counting house doesn't have enough money at hand. This is early New York, where a hectic variety of colonial notes, along with wampum, tobacco tickets, rum by the gallon, and, of course, slaves, serve as money substitutes. As Smith says to himself, it was all money in a world without money. Stranded in the city until matters can be sorted out, Smith becomes the object of fierce interest, both romantic and political. Rumors swirl that Smith may be funding an opposition movement to the Crown. On his first morning in the city, while he's eating in a coffee house, Smith is warned, as many an out-of-towner since has been, that New York isn't the city for him. This is a place, says Smith's new acquaintance, where things can get out of hand very quick. You would think, talking to the habitants, that all the vices and crimes of humanity had been left behind on the other shore. But the truth is, the people here are wild, suspicious, combustible, and the devil to govern. In all their relations, they are prompt to peer and gaze for the hidden motive, the worm in the apple, the serpent in the garden, they insist their new world to be. Before his adventures end, Smith will get a personal tour of the city's taverns, theaters, and debtors' prison. He'll be pressured to take part in society dinners, dances, and a duel. Ultimately, wallowing. <laughs> he, I think it kind of turned into that. Yeah, it was, it was a support. It turned into that in a, we a weird way. My impression is you felt you might have been violating an unspoken ballet rule, which is that ballet dancers don't reveal their difficulties. Exactly. Where does exactly. that come from? Like, what is that about? I don't know. Um, it's this ideal of perfection, of um, otherworldliness, of power and strength and confidence. That's what we try to emit on the stage in performance um, in the studio we have to you know be devoted with discipline and focus um, you know their humor comes in creativity comes in and there's quite a bit of mess but we don't want to show that to an audience so that's part of the game that's part of the thrill of it um, to be a ballet dancer and here you were on camera showing physical <laughs> problems showing pain yeah. One of the hard things for me to do was to show my limp to the camera um, and to show myself crying. I, 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 I'm not a crying kind of person anyway. And I, I knew that, you know, the camera people wanted some tears every once in a while. They wanted the reality. They wanted me to viscerally show what I was feeling. And it was very hard for me to do that. Um, the, the very few times I cried through the whole experience, it's in the film. So... Um, but I was, you know, embarrassed about my limp. Um, and there was a time that happened um, probably halfway through the filming where I had difficulty walking. My leg wouldn't accept the weight without a buckle. And so dancing was uh, a, a really big question. <laughs> and um, that was really hard for me to show. And I actually took a break from the filming 
at that moment, I needed to get some epidurals in my back, and I just was like, I, I just need some space. And mm-hmm. I, I actually learned how to meditate during that time. I just had the cameras leave, and because um, that was just that was just too much for me to show that I, I couldn't walk. What were your biggest worries about what your life would be like if you couldn't dance again? Well, I didn't want to lose the the voice I had physically, the mode of expression that I had, and and the, especially letting go the level of the expression that I had and changing the level. Um, I knew it so well. You know, it's just like having a voice or having a talent at writing and then losing a part of that, losing um, a vocal cord or losing access to your, you know, hand to write it down. It just, it was, 